What does it mean for publishers to produce transcripts that are actually helpful and compliant? That's what we're talking about on this week's episode of Sounds Profitable, Ad Tech Applied, with me, Brian Barletta. And me, Ariel Nissenblatt. Special thanks to our sponsors for making Sounds Profitable possible. Check them out by going to soundsprofitable.com and clicking on their logos in the article. Brian, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Oh, yeah. Thanks for having oh, me. Yeah. It's great to be here. <laughs> well, we have a lot to discuss today. It's all about transcripts and accessibility with Mayan Plout of 3Play Media. Tell me, how did you first get in touch with 3Play? Well, I met Mayan on Twitter. We had interacted a few times before, uh, and I didn't realize that Mayan was over at 3Play. And 3Play actually recently came on as a sponsor of Sounds Profitable, and we were digging into the concept of transcripts and the value there. And I was trying to learn a little bit more from them about how transcripts and all that are handled outside of podcasting. Because I, I think the truth is, is that we make a lot of assumptions with podcasting that we're the start and end of what we need to do. But realistically, we can learn so much from the other industries that come before us. I think transcripts an easy one. I mean, we're already experiencing transcripts on TV and you're streaming video and all, even live content with video has transcripts in most situations now. So they were the first people that I really got to sit down and learn a lot from. Uh, and my on was, you know, one of the people leading that conversation and we really hit it off. So I asked her to come on and talk through it a little bit more with me. I want to read a tweet that Mayan put out recently. She wrote, podcast transcripts need non-speech elements in order to be accessible to deaf and hard of hearing audiences. What constitutes a non-speech element? And how do you know what's important to include in your transcripts? And then she presented a mini thread on making podcasting more accessible. So we're going to link to that in the show notes of this episode because that is... Even just that anchor tweet introduced some concepts to me that I was not familiar with before. The concept of non-speech elements to include in your transcripts. I mean, it's something that I'd seen before when you when yeah. you see in parentheses somebody, you know, entering the room or maybe laughing or something like that. It's things that I had seen that I'd read, but I, I didn't consider. And so... I really want folks to be able to experience all of the knowledge that Mayan Plout was able to bring to this conversation, as well as to the Twitter space in in aiding in us better understanding this conversation. Yeah, I, I think she has a very unique perspective that is going to help us open our eyes because everything that you just talked about, when you're reading a transcript as a separate file that doesn't match up directly with the audio, hearing that someone or reading rather that someone entered the room doesn't necessarily resonate as well because it's not tracked it's not displayed by the player in a way that you can read it at the same time that it's happening in time and tempo so that video mindset is really where we need to get to well we're as an industry just struggling to provide them as a base response when someone says can i have the episode and says oh well here is the transcript as well so these people are experts at it and it was a really great conversation and i'm excited for all of you to get a chance to listen to it So transcription is such a big part of uh, video as well as podcasting. And video has probably a longer history with it than podcasting. So when we say transcription, what do we actually mean? So that is an excellent place for us to start because when I say the word transcripts to podcasters, they usually immediately jump to the process and production piece of things and where transcripts fit into that. And for the most part, what they're talking about is uh, turning audio into words that will help them in the production process, usually the editing process. It takes a long time to listen to a lot of audio. It is easier to scan a lot of words. And these rough transcripts are mainly for people to like improve their uh, interview and narrative podcasts. That is a super narrow way to think about transcripts and actually not the way in which I and a lot of us in the accessibility space are thinking about podcast transcripts. And it's mainly the one where transcripts are a means of podcast consumption for a podcast audience. And that actually has a very, very specific definition and also purpose. So a transcript is the way that deaf and hard of hearing audiences will experience your podcast. And you want them to experience it as fully as a hearing person who's listening to your podcast. And that is more than just getting all of the words that someone is saying down on paper. That's only a portion of what's going on. It also has to include all of those non-speech elements that really aid in somebody's comprehension of, of the content. 
all those non-speech elements, that's sound effects, audience reaction, music, the way in which somebody might be saying something, and also who's saying it as well. So speaker identification is actually a really big, important component of an accessible transcript, and that helps with comprehension probably more than anything else. Yeah. The speaker identification thing is really interesting because I have a great surround sound system. Like I, I really like entertainment stuff, so I put a lot of effort into it. But I also have very young kids and uh, it feels like nothing's mixed while anyways mm -hmm. on TV. So I can either hear the dialogue and wake up my kids with the explosions or the explosions can be normal volume and I can't hear the dialogue. So I do everything with subtitles now, which has also made going to the movies really uncomfortable for me lately. Uh, super getting off track there, but it feels like a lot of them don't even do speaker identification. <sighs> yeah, so... Within the movie world, this is also one of the reasons I prefer streaming video and not to mention COVID. Most of my movie media consumption has been at home on a screen, on my own screen with my own controls for two plus years now. I love subtitles because it makes it very easy for me to know who is speaking and what's going on, which especially when there's a lot of sound, especially when there's a lot of like back and forth really quickly. Every single uh, media producer sort of has like a slightly different standard about like how they want someone identified, whether it's by name or speaker one or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I love that because it really helps me connect the dots. I'm also not deaf or hard of hearing. And if that is the way in which you're experiencing audio, you actually need to know. And it makes yeah. a really big difference if somebody is off screen to know who is speaking. And if it's important to know who is speaking off screen, to me, the parallel is pretty clear for podcasting as well. Everybody is off screen. So how are you going to know who's going to say what? There's two of us on this podcast right now. Who is saying what? Yeah. No, this is all really exciting because, I mean, I think that everybody listening here does understand the value of making content more accessible for more people. But, like, when we think about it, like, this is about compliance, too, right? Like, this is about making sure that all of these people can consume all forms of media. And when we think about the quick AI transcriptions, which have a good place, right? There, it is a good starting place. A human can go in and improve it. It can get you some of the way, reduce the manual effort if you need to do that internally. But it's not the end answer because this isn't an SEO tool. This isn't something to copy the output and just slam it on a website. It's not to hope that it can tell which one of us is speaking right now and name that appropriately. We need to do more to make sure that we're following the laws and regulations on this, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And as someone with a name that is very difficult for a computer system to figure out how do you actually spell my on plout, I would love for a human to actually take a look at that and make sure that when I'm speaking, my name is actually spelled correctly as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important. So I, I touched on a little bit there. We've had some lawsuits in podcasting about transcription, but I've got to assume that the video industry, like everything that we're dealing with in podcasting, this isn't like net new. And I think the podcast industry struggles constantly from the fact that they believe sometimes like, oh man, it's the first time it's happened. It's no, we can learn from every industry before us. So we've had lawsuits. They're not quite settled yet. We're not really clear where to go. There's still no standards in podcasting. What can you tell us about what we can learn from the video industry and apply to podcasting today instead of just like expecting that we need to come up with it? Yeah. So there has been a ton of legislation around video broadcasts and digital media accessibility, and it's been over the last several decades. Um, and since podcasting is just now seeing it, like we don't know where it's going. But as you said, like we can sort of look back at what's happened so far to know what's going to happen in the future. So there's two really big accessibility laws in the United States that apply to just accessibility broadly. And there are sections that talk about audio accessibility. So the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, that one has two sections that talk about audio accessibility, Section 504, Section 508. Section 508 is the one that actually talks about federal communication and information technology and the fact that those have to be made accessible. And the most recent like refresh of that particular section talks about the guidelines, the WCAG guidelines. I'll get to that in a moment. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And those have uh, specific requirements for audio-only things. The second major accessibility law is the Americans with Disabilities Act. It is entirely about just making sure that people can access things. And there's two parts that talk about media accessibility. Title II is talking about how public entities deal with this. And then Title III is very broad. It talks about places of public accommodation. 
And that also includes private organizations that provide some sort of public thing. So usually it's applied to things like a doctor's office, a library, a hotel, things like that. But it actually becomes really interesting because that can also become something that applies to internet only businesses. And it's where places like Netflix and Amazon have sort of like fallen under attack about whether or not they need to provide accommodations for their audiences as well. So with Netflix, they were specifically sued around closed captioning and audio description. And in both of those specific cases, the outcome was that they had to have accurate captions for their streaming shows. And they also needed to provide audio description for all of their original content as well. So if we look at a parallel, how might this play out in podcasting? We are providing things in a public arena. We are making sure that things are available to the public. It is open access. People can get it anywhere. We could see a similar thing play out as well. There are two other just like small things that don't have like very immediate parallels for audio, but we see them in the broader media and broadcast space and they could add audio in the future. The 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, the CVAA, And then, of course, the FCC, which is about captioning quality standards and broadcast. So there's a ton of precedent for video, especially streaming video. And I would assume that we would see streaming audio following suit as well pretty soon. (laughs) Now, does that mean that streaming audio separate from podcasting does not already adhere to all of this? As far as I know, no, because I don't know that people are paying attention to it in this way. But if it is a podcast from a government organization if it is a podcast from a higher education institution or a place that provides, I don't know, if they're doing video already and they're providing captions because they've been sued in the past, I would hope that they are also following suit and doing so with podcasting. But they might not have gone as far or as deep as they might need to yet to say, oh, yes, our audio only content also needs to be accessible in this way. Yeah. Interesting. And, you know, in podcasting, I wrote a little bit about how right now some people pass it through the RSS feed. Some people put it in their episode description and link out to somewhere else. Uh, There's nobody currently putting it in the ID3 tag, which would allow it to happen in real time. So a player could respond to it and share it. Uh, So it's visually there lined up with the content uh, to take into account for dynamic ad insertion. Is there a clear standard in video that everybody can just like, if I decided I was going to go compete with Netflix tomorrow, is there like an organization I can look to and says, here's exactly what you have to follow because this is what Netflix and streaming video solutions have adhered to. And this is the framework of the video industry for that? Yes and no. So the the big, big picture is that the the WC3, the World Wide Web Consortium, WC3, um, they're the ones that provide these recommendations about how content should be made accessible. Those guidelines are the WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And there are three levels of compliance that people need to aim for. Number one, level A is just considered baseline. Like These are table stakes. And that actually does specifically talk about audio. And that when when we talk about audio, I'm specifically going to say for podcasts, that means transcripts, which by definition in the WCAG guidelines, which is redundant because it's web content accessibility guidelines. Under WCAG, podcasts have to have a text version of speech and the non-speech audio information that's going to be needed to also understand the content completely. Level two, which is like, if most places are saying that you have to like be uh, WCAG compliant, level two is usually what's stated. There's nothing additional there for audio. It's possible we could see it in future guidelines. And then level three, level triple A, is most comprehensive. It is hard to get to, but places really do need to try and strive for it. That one actually talks specifically about live audio and live events. So if podcasts are thinking about how we might live stream, how we might expand our audiences in other ways, that level three, the triple A might actually apply to them as well. So in terms of like, who's actually saying like, what is it? Usually what ends up happening is the lawsuits are saying, here's what you need to do in order to be compliant. And they'll cite some of the high level things or the, the the most trusted places that are sort of the places to look to in order to, to get your stuff up to up to code. But in terms of who's actually saying, like, is it being enforced or not? For the most part, it comes mainly from lawsuits or from civil rights organizations and advocacy groups seeing this is not actually happening and then trying to make it so. So the National Association for the Deaf is actually the one who's bringing some of the newest lawsuits for podcasting, along with obviously some advocates who are like immediately affected by this as well. So it's it's multi-layered, right? Like there's the people who say how it's supposed to go. There's the people who need to implement it. And if they're not implementing it, 
people are going to call them on it because they cannot access the content that is intended for everybody. Yeah. Uh, I mean, first off, huge bummer that like lawsuits are what's leading adoption here. But if I wanted to uh, adhere to WCAG, like the spec, is it comprehensible for someone without a technical background? Like could could a producer of a podcast read through it, get it and understand exactly what they have to apply? Usually, yes. But for the most part, like the easiest thing to do is just search for audio within all of these guidelines and just make sure that you understand what the specific like for audio. It means text needs to be written for all audio things and for non-speech elements. And I guess like more broadly here, like the output of it, audio is just a little bit behind on this front, right? Like video, there's lots of streaming players. There are a lot of broadcast entities. There are user generated platforms like YouTube, Vimeo, et cetera. What they've done is built sort of like the technical ways in which a transcript then shows up with content. Those are captions. It's a slightly different output file. But there's no immediate parallel for that within the audio space as well. Like to be fully compliant as a podcast player, any app that you might be using should be showing that transcript at the same time as somebody might be listening to the audio. So it's the equal experience thing is not like let's have a transcript on a website. That to me is sort of like a stopgap solution. Yeah. It really has to be in the place in which the podcast is being consumed. I don't even want to say audio because this is this is like part of the progression of how we start to also talk about podcasting being for everybody is to move away from the idea that podcast listening is the only way in which this gets done. It is also podcast audiences, podcast consumption. Podcast consumption is more than just listening to audio. It is also reading transcripts. And that that's something that will get to a place of normalization soon enough, but we're not really there yet either. But it, but it's the right time to say it as we push podcasting into video and other formats. It is what we're telling people in an open framework is that you are a content creator and your primary channel has been audio. But now you're being challenged to explore text and you're being challenged to explore video and see if those channels do work for you. Some of them you're going to need to comply with. Uh, others like video might not be what what works for you like sounds profitable doesn't do numbers on video yet don't have really the focus to like push that avenue yet but it's one of those interesting things right not everything works for everyone but the transcription aspect is really critical and i think that what's clear here is the wicag guidelines uh like you said redundant it's clear you can start implementing it now there are partners like uh three play media that adhere to that that can make you compliant immediately I think that that's kind of crazy that we're not moving forward with that as soon as possible. It's not like someone in podcasting is raising their hand and saying, hey, uh, we'd like to challenge that and make a podcasting unique one, which we shouldn't do because we cannot continue to be a unique silo ignoring the history that's come before us. So adopting that is really smart because here's the truth. Every podcast player can transcribe and make best guesses using AI to figure out what's going on there, but they are definitely not putting a human in front of that. And that transcript is not going to be as accurate or as complete or even usable for the person consuming it. It might put them off completely. The only way for adoption is if the publishers who own very little, remember the publishers get download stats back. They own their episode. They distribute it to places that they say can call to them for the episode content. The publishers should defend that. That is a translation, a transcription, an interpretation of their content and allowing anybody else to do that for you and not giving you the rights to edit it. Wild. We need to get ahead of that. And what this means is we need to follow this guideline, implement it as fast as possible and make sure it comes from the same destination where the file comes from so that we can say to Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and Google, hey, enough of us do this. Please acknowledge it and display it correctly in your app. And then they're the ones that we can stick the lawsuits after. Your future sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm trying. We got to be optimistic yeah. on this stuff. And it's it's definitely really interesting that audio, which predates video, is behind on this. Yeah. When video is leading the charge, like we need to get this together. Podcasting is on demand. It doesn't even need to be there at time of launch. Should it? Absolutely. But if you're down to the wire, you're pushing your episode out and you can get it out 24 hours later. You know what? That's a good move today. Probably like me should have more bandwidth in your production cycle. Uh, But for daily shows, you know, it can take a little bit more. effort. Yeah. And I guess like it seems pretty easy to start doing right now. But really what we're talking about is 
changing workflows to include more people. And that means both what it means to make the podcast, but also what it means for somebody to interact with their show on the other end. Like my seven years coming up to now in podcasting has always been about, we just want people to love what you've made. And if the only way in which you, a producer, interact with your show is through listening to it, you are not thinking about the 20% of audiences that are probably going to try and interact with it in another way. So one of the ways in which to like start to narrow down, like what are the most important non-speech elements? Of course, speaker identification is one of the most important parts, but all of the different sounds, if they're not important for comprehension, they don't need to be in the transcript. But if they're not important for comprehension, why are they in the show? And if they're in the show to like elicit tone, that is absolutely something to include in a transcript. So I think it actually makes producers more aware if they're starting to think about transcripts, not as it's going to help me edit my show, but like I'm thinking about the transcript as part of the production experience because I want the thing that I'm making at the end to be understood and felt by everybody who wants to interact with my show. Okay, Brian Barletta, I've got takeaways. I hope you do. (laughs) That's my job, isn't it? All right. So Mayan brought something up at the beginning of the conversation that I want to go back to, which is that when podcasters hear the word transcript, for the most part, they're thinking about how they can use the transcript to aid in the creation process. And I became aware of this tactic when I was at SALT, the audio documentary school in Maine, because if you get hours and hours of tape with somebody You're going to want an easy way to comb through that. And an easy way to do that is to upload it to a transcription service like Otter or 3Play or Descript or Trint. I could go on all day. And then control F for the words or the phrases that you know you want to include in that conversation or to you know you want to cut out of the conversation. And then what do you do? You tailor your voiceover based on the transcript that you have created through this AI process. What Mayan is saying is that transcripts should be transcripts first for the sake of being transcripts for accessibility reasons. And there are certain elements like identifying the active speaker that are not present in the editing version of the transcript. So first of all, I'd love to know what you think about that and if you've experienced that as a creator. And then I want to talk a little bit about my experience transcribing my podcast and where I'm falling short. Yeah. Well, let me start first by saying that Sounds Profit will fall short. You know, I think we strive to try out all these different tools, but some of them uh, slip off, right? We use different transcription services. We've migrated from Wushka to now we're on Triton. We've used Descript and Adobe. We've manually edited certain certain things. It's not easy to do all of this, but that's not a good excuse. Um, we all can and should do better, but it's a great example of it, right? If there was ad dollars if there was a driving force behind it, which is what I tried to push in an article I wrote recently, that advertisers should be asking for transcripts to shore up through machine learning and through other tools what they're actually buying on, then it becomes a non-starter for the mid to enterprise side of podcasting to have to provide them. So I think that I strive for us to present a really good face to all of this. But I think the problem is, is that because it's not in my face as a consumer, it's not something that I can turn on transcripts in the Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or Google apps and see it in real time. And it's synced perfectly and it takes into account dynamic ad insertion. It's easy for me to think that it's not yet part of podcasting. And that's not healthy. That's not right. Because this is about accessibility and reach. We're in the second phase of podcasting where the truth is, is that podcasting needs to be part of what you do. We are content creators. This is our favored channel. This might be our best performing channel. It might be one of the more successful channels as we grow it. But by taking your podcast and making it a transcript, you are now also a writer. You have potential for a website for someone to go to. You have potential for a newsletter. You are different ways for people to interact with you just like video. So I definitely agree that transcripts for accessibility should be the first goal. Accessibility extends reach. It's not just performative, but... I really do fear that unless ad dollars force people's hands to make this a standard and we get an overwhelming number of podcasts that pass it and the apps respond by including it, it's not going to take on anytime soon. I think the apps responding by including it is huge. 
just ima- I, I don't even think most folks can imagine what that might look like, because right now, what do you do when you're listening to a podcast? You hit play, you put your phone in your pocket or you put it on the other side of the room and you listen to the show while you're cleaning, while you're cooking, while you're walking around the house or the neighborhood. So what would it mean actually to have a transcript on the phone that you could follow along if you wanted to or if you needed to? I've started Putting transcripts on when I watch anything on TV Me to the too. point where now when I go to a movie theater, my experience is completely jarring. It's it's very uncomfortable now. I, the mixing is awful on these things. I can't quite tell what's going on. And I love it. There are little things that I just miss. And when I get to see the transcript and I get to see the captions and the subtitles that explain what's going on, I feel more engaged. I feel more pulled in. I feel like I didn't miss out and I have to read a recap article or a listen to a recap podcast afterwards because everything was presented to me, even if I didn't completely notice it. So I think for podcasting, especially for narrative, I'd really like that because there's a lot where I want to go back and listen to it and it still doesn't sink in or I'm not clear who's talking. I mean, some of my favorite narrative podcasts, I've struggled to figure out who the like who the speaker was for easily five or 10 minutes, sometimes entire episodes, or you're coming back to something and you're not remembering who it is. So I think with the app having an option, I'm I'm not picturing a world where we're going to keep our phone on and read transcripts while we're listening to a podcast. But I think it becomes something that if you know it's there and it's really important, it'll be really powerful. It would also be incredibly powerful to pass clips, make little headliner type videos from all the players. As a consumer. Well, I mean, even even the way that I wrote our outline for today's conversation was with the Descript transcript, which, of course, is not perfect and is not going to be the transcript that we put up word for word on the website. But it really helped me to be able to see which word was being highlighted when I could read along. It's a fun way to experience listening and reading a podcast. Paul F. Tompkins tweeted this week. I know I have become a true fan of a podcast when I experience that magical moment. I can now differentiate the host voices. So (laughs) this is something that could (laughs) this is something that could be aided with by a transcript and you can become a fan much sooner. (laughs) You know, deep cut for Brian. But Paul F. Tompkins is actually he was on my first podcast I ever listened to Thrilling Adventure Hour. No way. Yeah. Huge fan of him. Wow. Love that. I want to share a practical tip from Mayan. She says that if you're a publisher who wants to get compliant, but all of these guidelines are long and the legal jargon is confusing, just control F the word audio and make sure you understand everything there because WCAG, W-C-A-G, applies to a lot more than just audio. So you're going to want to know what applies to you as a podcast publisher. And how do we practically move towards a world where accessibility is not an afterthought? I really liked Mayan's suggestion of not just calling it podcast listening because some people are going to consume a podcast in all sorts of ways. And one of those ways might be reading a transcript. They may never even hear the podcast, whether that's because they are hard of hearing or deaf or because they don't want to. Maybe they just want to read the podcast. Maybe they consume content. Maybe they are stronger readers than they are listeners. I'm the opposite of that. But some people just want to consume a podcast by way of by way of reading. And that should be okay. And that should be accessible to them. I'm right there with you. And this we're hitting a point in podcasting where we're going to see people pull pieces of this apart. And what what is audio only is going to be incredibly challenged because we're looking at silos and video solutions pulling people out. We're looking at text options, turning a podcast into a newsletter or a website, all of those things. If you don't acknowledge that you're creating amazing content and make it accessible to wherever your audience is, and you should explore that, then you are going to be left behind. The industry is rapidly going to change in the open nature of podcasting and the ability for it to lend itself to so many other formats is going to make it easy for someone to slice this pie up and say, well, podcasting shrunk when really podcasting as its core has spread into so many different things. So transcripts for that reason are fantastic, but for accessibility are killer. I think we need to really do that. And and my aunt made it one of my favorite points. She doesn't want a robot trying to write her name out. (laughs) Yeah. My aunt Plout, even Ariel Nissenblatt, I get some pretty ridiculous AI transcriptions. I've gotten Arianism Black. I've gotten 
just just that's wh- rough i know and yeah you definitely need somebody going through that afterwards and making sure that that is not what's going to be published on a website god that's your dark harry potter persona <laughs> so listeners what do you think about the show we want to hear from you please reach out if you have any questions or comments we're on twitter at sounds prof news at ryan barletta or at ari this and that and if you want to send us an email that's podcast at sounds This show is recorded with Squadcast, the best place to record studio quality video and audio for content creators. I use Squadcast for every single podcast recording and my product deep dives. Check out the latest one we did with Triton Digital at soundsprofitable.com slash deep dives. And check out squadcast.fm for a free seven day trial. And please let me know what you think. Do you want more from Sounds Profitable? Well, you're in luck because we have two more podcasts that you can explore. First up is Sounds Profitable, the narrated articles. And next, the download, our podcast about the business of podcasting. And both of those are available in Spanish. You can find links to them in the episode description. Thank you to Evo Terra and Ian Powell for their help on this episode. And thanks to you for listening to this episode of Sounds Profitable, Ad Tech Applied with me, Brian Barletta. And me, Ariel Nissenblatt. Until next time. Rad. <laughs> <laughs>